Welcome back to the show. This is Rail Talk, the podcast. I'm your host, Rail. Don't forget to like the show on iTunes and SoundCloud. Follow me on Instagram at Raleigh Rail and on Twitter at Rail Talk Podcast. On today's show, I want to talk about a 20-year-old black male by the name of Corin Rodney Thomas, who was gunned down in Raleigh, North Carolina by a so-called neighborhood watchman. Then I want to talk about Judge Olu Stevens out of Louisville, Kentucky, who dismissed two panels of all-white juries after stating that there was no way African-American males could get a fair trial when they were not being judged by a jury of their peers. Then I want to talk about a federal investigation that came out saying that Baltimore City does profile African-American males. And I want to talk about Gabrielle Douglas in the Olympics. Let's get the show started. Now, I probably wouldn't say this in front of white folk, but in front of your own speak my mind. Chad Copley could face the death penalty if convicted of murder. In a 911 call, he seems to say he was only meaning to protect his family and his home. But a neighbor is speaking out tonight, saying what happened should be investigated as a hate crime. Ushered into the courtroom, cuffed and shackled, 39-year-old Chad Copley winks at his wife, family and supporters holding back tears. Mr. Copley. It was just before 1 o'clock Sunday morning here at his North Raleigh home on Single Leaf Lane, where police say he fired a shotgun from inside his garage toward the street, striking and killing 20-year-old Corin Rodney Thomas. Someone just got shot. Someone shot, them, shot him out of his house. Just as that witness called for help, another 911 call appears to come in from Copley. Uh, we have a lot of people outside of our house yelling and shouting profanity. Uh, I yelled at them, please uh, leave the premises. Uh, they were showing a, a firearm, so I, I, I fired a warning shot, and uh, we, we got somebody that, uh, that got hit. The man's body was right in front of the mailbox. I don't think, I don't know how he was a threat from the garage. Jalen Lewis lives two doors down and hosted a party that night where he says Thomas was one of 50 people who showed up. He says he didn't see any of his guests carrying a gun and wasn't aware any were causing problems. A very different account than what we hear in this 911 call placed just minutes before that fatal shot was fired. Uh, in the week, we've had a bunch of rooms out here waiting. Um, I am off the road and I was going to have firearms and we're going to screw our neighborhood. If I were you, I can TV equipment. We're going to go secure our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Does that surprise you? Yeah, very much so. Like, I don't know. That it kind of struck a nerve when, when I heard that one. It's kind of, I don't know, it sounds borderline hate crime. Hoodlums outside of my house showing a firearm. Protect my neighborhood. He's trying to use the Castle Doctrine, the same exact law that George Zimmerman used in the Trayvon Martin murder. One thing, though, coward, this guy wasn't in your yard. They found his body in the street in front of the mailbox. Everybody knows that mailboxes are typically at the very tip of somebody's property. And he fired the gun from a window inside of a garage. And there is no law saying that you have to fire a warning shot. And an attorney said today that even if you fire a warning shot, the warning shot is normally fired in the air, not horizontal into a crowd of people. That's not a warning shot. That's a kill shot. So people were saying that, you know, black people will be out in the streets. And I'm going to tell y'all, like I said before, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina right now. That's where I live. It's where I'm from. We're not out in the streets for one reason and one reason only. He's in jail. And that's all we've ever, we've ever asked for was that people need to pay for the crimes they commit against black people, against people in general. But when crimes are committed against black people, people are allowed to go home after being questioned by police and chill until the trial starts. This man is in jail. This man has deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison for murder, premeditated murder. When somebody says, I'm going to protect my neighborhood, protect him from what? You're not in harm's way. They were at the next door neighbor's house. They were headed to the party next door. They weren't thinking about you. It's one o'clock in the morning. They didn't even know you were there. So he's lying when he says he told them to leave. They were yelling at him and showing a firearm. That's a lie. That's why I think this is an open and shut case. They arrested him immediately. They arrested this guy immediately after listening to his lying story. And what's even more 
disheartening about the, the, the whole case to me is that, you know, you go online and I'll read y'all just one of the, the most disheartening comments that I read online. And this is a guy talking about how he feels about what happened. He said that this man is like many of us homeowners. He is fed up with the scum that comes into our neighborhoods and creates problems. This is a home I am buying and I'm so sick of having scum coming through my place screaming Black Lives Matter. No one should die. But on the other hand, no one has the right to disrupt people's lives. Let's be clear. Nobody screaming Black Lives Matter is on this man's street. This street is full of middle income people. Black and white. So for him to make this this uh, statement, it's almost like he's really saying I'm so sick of black people coming into my neighborhoods because nobody's scum. My man, it's a free country. We can live, drive and visit where we want to live. But for you to say I'm tired of the scum coming to our neighborhoods, that's cold word for I'm tired of these niggas coming to my neighborhoods. It's cold word. So, like I said, man, we'll see where this case goes. I'm right down the street from where it happened, so I'm definitely going to keep y'all, my listeners, posted on what's going on with this case. We ain't going to let this one ride. Not going to happen. Now I want to talk about Judge Olu Stevens. For y'all that don't know, Judge Olu Stevens made the news because he dismissed two panels of all-white juries. A Jefferson County Circuit Court judge has dismissed at least two jury panels after concerns were raised over whether the jurors fairly represented the community. Damon Shanklin was charged with cultivating marijuana and his trial started last week. Like usual, a panel of 41 jurors was brought in, but they were all later dismissed. In this grainy court video, Judge Olu Stevens says only three of the potential jurors are black. The concern is that the panel was not representative of the community, although it was randomly selected. Judge Stevens brought new jurors in, and it's not the first time he's done so. It also happened last November. The defense attorney in a theft case raised concerns that there was only one African-American juror and he was randomly taken off the panel during jury selection. We're talking about a situation where we have not a single member of this jury that is going to be of Mr. Doss's uh, race. It concerns me greatly um, and, and, and enough so I'm going to grant the motion. I'm going to set aside the jury uh, entirely. Let me tell you all something. I wholeheartedly agree with the judge taking a stand because it's not fair. Most of these juries are all white. And I'm going to tell y'all, I saw something earlier where a prosecutor in the same state said that, you know, no jurisdiction is perfect, that they had to, that they have to do better as far as making sure they get black jurors. But then he said that people got to make sure they answer to the jury duty. Notices that they, that they get in mail. Let me be the first to tell y'all. I've never gotten a jury duty notice in mail. I'm 30 years old. I don't know what age you start getting them, but I'll tell you this. I've been working since I was 17. I've never to this day gotten a jury duty notice in mail because I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Most people want to run from jury duty. I'm ready to go to jury duty. And then I'll tell y'all a personal story, man. When I was like 25, I had got a speeding ticket. And so... I remember going to court and I kept getting it postponed or continued because I didn't think I was speeding. So after getting it continued about two or three times, I finally had to go to court. And when I went to court, they had me in this courtroom with another case that was going on. So the courtroom wasn't crowded. It was the judge, you know, two attorneys, a DA. I was sitting where you sit when you're waiting on your trial to be called. And then there was a case going on and there was a young black man, about 18 years old. He was accused of stealing an iPod out of a kid's book bag at, at school. So the kid's dad was there giving a story about what happened to the iPod and how they found out the kid, the black kid had stole the iPod. A lot of you not. This black kid was in this courtroom all by himself. No mama, no daddy, no brother, no sister, no cousin, no granddaddy, no nobody. And he had a white court appointed attorney. So it was just this young 18, 19 year old black kid in this courtroom with about eight or nine white people. And I'm sitting back there ready to defend my case for a speeding ticket. And I'm looking at this young boy like, yo, he don't stand a chance. 
And y'all should have heard everything they were saying about him as far as his upbringing and that he didn't deserve a second chance because he had been arrested before for theft. And, and I'm like, where is his mom? Where is his aunt? Where is his uncle? He has to have somebody there with him, but he was in there all by himself. And that broke my heart. And like I said, I was a young man and I didn't have the mentality that I have now. But even then, I knew that something was not right. But unfortunately, Judge Olu Stevens operates in a system of white supremacy. Unfortunately. So when you speak out against a system that pays you, they will reprimand you. And so with Judge Olu Stevens coming out and symbolically making a stand about these all white juries. You know, he got reprimanded. And unfortunately, you know, I'm sure he knew when he came out and said what he said, this was going to happen. Battled Louisville Judge Olu Stevens will serve a 90 day suspension without pay. He admits he was wrong for racially charged comments in public and on social media. But the bigger battle over all white juries is not over yet. I want to say that I'm delighted to have this over with, move forward, and I'm looking forward to getting back to the bench. Judge Olu Stevens brought a stunning conclusion to his war of words with Commonwealth's Thanks. attorney Tom Wine. I do not believe Tom Wine is a racist. Monday before the Kentucky Judicial Conduct Commission, the judge backed down from the fight, apologizing for social media posts saying the county's top prosecutor wanted all white juries. The funny thing is, they know that those all white juries are not giving African-American males fair trials. They know this. But how can you expect the people to, that's doing the wrong to investigate themselves? You see, they know they know that these all white juries are not giving these African-American or young people of color fair trials. When we're being persecuted in the media, in the public eye. So if a young black male comes into a, a courtroom with all white jury jurors and he's convicted, he's accused of a crime. No matter what he says, if he doesn't have proper representation, he's going to jail. And fortunately, a brother like Olu Stevens is like, you know what? Enough is enough. Bring me some more jurors that look like the guy who y'all are trying to convict. I know they're out there. And they try to use the excuse of we don't answer to the jury summons. I have never gotten a jury summons in my life. My brother hasn't, who's a year older than me, and my older brother, who's four years older than me. Neither one of us have ever received a summons for jury duty. So I don't think this is a case of African-Americans or people of color ignoring these jury summons. I think they are purposely making sure they do not get us on these juries. Because if we're not attorneys, if we, if we don't go to law school, or if, if we're not you know, entrenched into this judicial system, there's no other way we would be able to affect the outcome of a court case unless we're on a jury. And I guarantee you there's a way where they can tell your race before they send you out these jury notices. And I and, and I don't know, but I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the numbers. But I wanna I'm I'm curious as to all of this stuff that's going on in the black community. All these black men are, are being incarcerated at high rates and that's been going on. But I wonder now since people are getting smarter I wonder now, has the rate of African-American who are getting jury duty notices gone down? I guarantee y'all that it have, but I'm going to check. And on the next show, I'm going to give you all the numbers. The brother wasn't wrong about anything. But when you operate in the system of white supremacy, it's I'm white and I say so. And the brother fell victim to it. So unfortunately, he got to be suspended for 90 days without pay. So there's a GoFundMe page. I'm going to put up the link under this podcast. Y'all go support the brother. Hold the brother down while he ain't getting paid. You know what I mean? It is what it is. All right. And I want to talk about um, the Justice Department in Baltimore, Maryland, finds that Baltimore police are racially biased. African-American residents and African-American neighborhoods bore the brunt of this activity. Out of the data we surveyed, the police department made roughly 44% of its stops in two small, predominantly African-American districts that contain only 11% of the city's population. 
African Americans accounted for 95% of the 410 individuals the police department stopped at least 10 times. Indeed, one African American man was stopped 30 times in less than four years, with none of the stops resulting in a citation or a criminal charge. We also found a pattern or practice of excessive force. For example, officers frequently resorted to physical force when a person did not immediately respond to verbal commands, even where the person was posing no imminent threat to the officer or others. Officers were ending up in unnecessarily violent confrontations with people in mental health, uh, with mental health disabilities. We have seen communities throughout the country that improved policies and enhanced training and de-escalation and dealing with people in crisis can actually enhance officer safety and reduce the need for force. BPD also violates the First Amendment by retaliating against individuals engaged in constitutionally protected activities. Officers frequently detain and arrest members of the public for engaging in speech that officers perceive to be critical uh, or disrespectful. And BPD officers use force against members of the public who are engaging in protected speech. Finally, although this pattern or practice investigation did not review the specific circumstances surrounding Freddie Gray's death, we did investigate BPD's transport practices. And our report identifies concerns about the safety risks and lack of data in BPD's transport practices. We also identified deficiencies in the way that BPD uh, investigates sexual assaults. Unfortunately, in the black community, this is something we've been saying for the last. 20 or 30 years that we're being harassed by police officers that when we get pulled over we didn't do anything wrong but they want us to shut up and do what we're told and then when we go you know crying to the media or crying to uh file a complaint they look at us like man stop crying nobody's profiling you it's all in your head why would I profile you? Why would I put my job in jeopardy for you? That's always the answers that we get when we ask or when we say, yo, do racially profile me. And I'm telling y'all, if y'all have listened to my podcast before, I've been racially profiled twice in my life where when it happened and after it happened, I knew, yo, I was blatantly profiled and the cop could care less that he knew I knew he was profiling me. So what they found in the city of Baltimore, in my opinion, is a slap in the face because you just let those officers off for murdering Freddie Gray, saying there was no wrong doing done. So who killed Freddie Gray? If when they arrested him, he was able to walk into the paddy wagon and then he's dead, somebody has to be held responsible for taking his life. Even if it's indirectly. At that particular time, he was the responsibility of the city of Baltimore Police Department. But that's too much like right for people to use common sense. You know, it's very convenient for the city of Baltimore to release these numbers when any chances of these officers going to jail are too far away. So the jurisdiction is passed. They cannot be arrested or cannot be retried for those, I mean, for the for the Freddie Gray murder. So if you ask me, this was purposely done. And that black mayor, that woman who was sitting back there, man, she got to go straight up. She got to go because she need to make change in that community and she not doing it. OK, when you when you just let police officers, crooked police officers go. And then all of a sudden, three weeks later, you release a study. Come on, man. They they knew what the deal was before that study came out. And I, and I guarantee you they had those results. But they figured if we come out with these results, it'll be an open and shut case towards these officers. And somehow we got to let these, all these officers walk. So in order to do that, we got to make sure we hold these results. And that's very unfortunate. So on a, on a kind of lighter note, I want to talk about Gabrielle Douglas. Y'all know Gabrielle Douglas took the world by storm in the Olympics in 2012 and she's doing the same thing now, killing the game. And unfortunately she was trending on Twitter yesterday for the, for the wrong reason. People were talking about her hair again. Now y'all know that back then in 2012, they talked about her hair then too, but people are doing it again now. And it's unfortunate because nobody cares. Nobody cares. She's out there getting busy, sweating, grinding, you know, living her dreams. 
she could care less about her edges, her ponytail, or all the other stuff that the people who are sitting at home on Twitter tweeting about. She can care less what they're talking about. But it's unfortunate, man, because we got to protect our young women. And so people did, did, you know, clap back at the trolls who were uh, dissing, you know, the young lady. But it's just unfortunate that you got to see stuff like that, man, because, you know, she out here grinding, living her dreams. There's a lot of young black kids, toddlers who, who look up to her, who are like, mom, dad, I want to do that. So we can't let people, you know, ostracize her in, in the media. All right. So that's that. And again, like I told y'all last week, I'm filming a documentary called Without Shelter. So I'm documenting the lives of about 20 or 30 homeless people in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, they live in the downtown area. So I remember being a kid and we would walk through this park because we didn't have a car. And so we would walk through this park to get on the city transportation, to public transportation. And there was always this park full of homeless people. I mean, 100, 150 people at a time. So the older I get, the older I got, these people started to disappear. But what happened was they started to build high rises and these really nice apartments and houses in this area near this park. So now you ride by this park, there's a lot of people walking dogs, you know, people in the park playing card games, you know, doing stuff that people that live downtown would normally do. So I was trying to figure out what happened to the people, to the homeless who used to be in this park. So I went down there one day and I only saw a few people and they told me, hey, listen, come back down here on Saturday because on Saturdays, you know, they don't get harassed by the police and a few volunteer groups come down here and feed us breakfast. So I showed back up on a Saturday and a lot of y'all not, man. It was it was overwhelming. I knew I was going to see more people than I saw the, the, the time before. But when I say there were so many people down there who were less fortunate that it literally it made me rethink how I was going to shoot the documentary. Because I was talking to people who, some weren't even homeless. They just were down and out, down on their luck. And, you know, they needed a little extra food because, you know, all the money goes to bills and living expenses. And so, like I said, we're in the downtown area. And so a guy told me that I needed to talk to, to a lady who was part of an organization that has this warehouse in the cut and she feeds the homeless breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I go back there, I find her and she explains to me what she does and how she does it, how, how she makes it all possible. And another thing, man, shout out to Panera Bread. Panera Bread gives money, excuse me, Panera Bread gives food to the homeless and to the homeless shelters on the regular. I didn't know that. And uh, just my observation, most of those people down there, man, are, are, are suffering from mental illness, for real. I saw guys who were my age, you know, 25 to 30, having full-blown conversations with themselves, walking around completely lost. And it broke my heart because I'm looking at myself in these young men. This one guy was having a conversation with himself just walking through the street. And he maybe was 27, maybe, at the oldest. But he was having a full-blown conversation with himself. And I looked at him and I watched him. And later on that day, I was talking to the organizer of this, of this, uh, of this, of this breakfast. And he walked over to her and asked her, does she have any clothes? She said, no, I don't have any today. He walked away. And I'm telling y'all that. That was one of the hardest things I've ever witnessed because I said to myself, man, yo, somebody had him. Somebody gave birth to him. Somebody at some point in time was elated that they were giving birth to him. You know, at some point in time in the hospital, he was passed around by family and friends like this is my baby. And now he's on the streets and nobody's looking for him. He's just another guy on the streets. Where's his brother, his mom, his cousin, his sister? His dad, where are these people? That's hard to see. That's hard to, it's hard to witness because when I took on this challenge about filming this documentary, I wanted them to tell their stories. Some of the stories I'm hearing is like, man, are you serious? You know, where are your, fa where's your family? Most people say, you know, my family, 
They don't want nothing to do with me. Be it for drugs or, you know, stealing or just, you know, they gave up on them. Like, you know, we tried to get you help once before. You didn't want it. We tried again. You didn't want it. So now you're on your own. But, you know, for the most part, it's like, man, it's, it's these people live on the streets. And nobody cares. You know, the organization that I that I ran across. They were doing a great thing, but I asked her, I said, what do you do about the mental illness? She said, you know, honestly, we don't get into all that. You know, we just make sure they eat, which is great. We make sure they eat. They, they get a hot shower. They have uh, clean bathrooms and they get to fellowship with each other. She said they, they tell them to come as is. You know, they don't. They don't make them take showers before they come. Hey, you come stinking, you come stinking. It, it's, it's whatever. It's cool. Just come in there and fellowship. And I think that's a beautiful thing. But I was like, man, what do y'all do about the mental illness? Because most of them are suffering from a mental illness. I was talking to two gentlemen who didn't seem to be homeless. It's just like they came to get a bite to eat, you know. And a homeless guy interrupted. But it seemed like a cool guy to me. He walked up and he started talking and these other two gentlemen, they got up and bounced. And so as I'm filming him, I, I come home and I upload the video and uh, somebody that I know says, hey, I know that guy. That's a mean old man. He's always mean whenever I see him, he comes to my job. And I'm like, are you serious? Because when I talked to him, he was just as nice and as calm. He was telling jokes. But the person that I knew was like, yo, that guy is evil. The guy I talked to for an hour was very joyful. He seemed to be, you know, content. He was like, yo, I'm good. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm homeless, but hey, you know, I'm, but I'm not homeless. You know, this is, this is my home. I don't have a shelter, but I'm really not homeless. These people got stories and, you know, they're, they're, they're going through a lot. And it's, uh, it's deep. It's very deep. So about 60% of the people that they see are homeless, but the other 40%, they're not homeless. It's people who are down on their luck or is really trying to stretch a dime or a dollar and they just come there to get a bite to eat because she said they, they, they don't turn anybody away, right? They don't care if you come in there with a suit on or with a bag on. You can eat. Anybody can eat. And that's a beautiful thing. So the documentary is called Without Shelter. You can find it by Googling or YouTubing Without Shelter documentary or you can go to YouTube and look up Raleigh Rail. And it's the latest video I've uploaded. So it's the trailer. Y'all check it out. Please share it. Share it with your friends. Tell your friends to share it. Because I definitely want to get out here and help our people who are homeless and who are in need. That's all I got for y'all tonight. As I always say, y'all go be great. And don't ever let a person tell you who you are. Thank y'all for listening to Rail Talk, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>